professionals, researchers, and concerted citizens to learn forest health in the southeastern United States. Today, we're joined by Dr. Matt Casson, Associate Professor of Forest Pathology at West Virginia University. Um, Dr. Casson will discuss the potential of Verticillium non alfalfa as a biological control agent for Tree of Heaven. And with that, I will turn that over to Dr. Casson. I am handing you the baton. It's thinking, it's thinking. Okay, should be able to share. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Dar. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you sound great. Great, well, um, it's great to see so many people um, tuning in uh, for my talk. I, I recognize some names on there. Um, so it'll be great to, to catch people up to speed on where we are with this project. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, although um, Molly indicated that, you know, some of you may know me from some of the other fungal ecology work I do. Really, this is the project I've been working on the longest. Um, I started my PhD at Penn State in 2007 and graduated in 2012. But I've been involved with uh, biocontrol of Tree of Heaven since that time. Um, and I'm going to take you through from the beginning um, all the way up to current day. So again, feel free to post questions and I'm sure um, Dr. Dar will uh, interject to ask those questions because um, I don't think you have a way to ask directly, but I'm happy to entertain those questions. So um, many of you may be familiar with these um, invasive uh, species trackers. Um, you can go onto the web and um, basically look at the distribution of various invasive species. Um, I took this screenshot from this morning. This is the known distribution of Alanthus um, in the United States. Um, I'll be referring to Tree of Heaven as Alanthus. Um, Alanthus, although it's the genus name um, in Latin, it's also used as a common name for Tree of Heaven. So if you hear me saying Alanthus, I mean Tree of Heaven. Um, and what you can clearly see is that uh, Tree of Heaven is pretty widespread. Uh, it occurs in uh, 40 states, um, and of course, its distribution is is most heavy in in the eastern United States, specifically the Mid Atlantic, um, and that has something to do with its introduction history. Uh, but I'll get into that. One of the things I want to caution about is is interpreting these maps. Sometimes, you know, um, certainly these highlighted counties note where Atlantis has been recovered or recorded, but it doesn't mean that the extant populations exist currently in those counties. For example, in Minnesota and Maine, um, some of those populations have been previously documented, uh, but my attempts to recover, you know, seed or leaf tissue from those locations failed due to lack of existing um, individuals in those locations. So um, local eradication efforts um, might move a county from green to white. And likewise, there may be plenty of green counties. And I know of an, an example in, in Southeast South Dakota where Atlantis exists, but it's not green here on the map. So again, you know, take these with a grain of salt because there's always a lag in the transfer of information from the scientific literature um, to these kind of web portals that, that provide kind of an interface for general users. Um, so why do we care about a tree that arrived in 1784? I'm going to tell you all about its its history and movement, but really there's been a, a real spike in interest uh, with Tree of Heaven because of, uh, of a new pest called Spotted Lanternfly. And it's even possible that there was another webinar on Spotted Lanternfly in this very um, series. I'm, I'm not familiar, but it's possible. Um, now, there's something known as an invasion meltdown uh, where one invasive species in a new environment makes it easier for other non-native species to invade. Now, what we know about spotted lanternfly is that it, it has other hosts besides Tree of Heaven, uh, but Tree of Heaven appears to be a preferred host. Whether it's essential for its development is, is not something I'm fully aware of because I don't study spotted lanternfly, but you can use Alanthus to find spotted lanternfly. In fact, they serve as kind of beacons on the landscape. Not only do they serve as beacons on the landscape, but they serve as bridges across the landscape. Here we can see in the lower right hand corner a map of, of spotted lanternfly positive counties. Now this is a little outdated. Um, I apologize for that, but this is a nice map where they actually juxtapose 
um, Atlantis distribution, and these are based on FIA plots, um, these forest inventory and analysis plots uh, that the Forest Service um, um, keeps track of, um, overlaid with spotted lanternfly. Um, and what you can <clears throat> note, at least, in the areas where spotted lanternfly has been documented and established, there tends to be a higher incidence of Atlantis um, in FIA plots in those counties or in those uh, regions uh, where spotted lantern fly. So certainly it can serve as a, um, a food source um, for, these, um, for these plant hoppers um, early on um, as they move into new areas, inadvertently on RVs or in other ways that these pests are moving. Um, and here we can kind of see an FIA data um, so kind of zoomed out to show the Atlantis distribution. And again, I just want to point out that Atlantis does very well in the mid-Atlantic United States, stretching from Pennsylvania all the way down um, into the southeast, uh, but not into the extreme south. Um, if you've ever driven the I-81 corridor, you notice that Atlantis kind of fades out as you cross into North Carolina and really um persian silk tree um kind of takes over so you know there are other invasive trees that might serve as um beacons on the landscape for other invasive pests uh, but that's just um something to think about so what do we know about um tree of heaven well we know it was introduced into philadelphia in 1784. um whether or not you realize this philadelphia is actually the what's the center of botany uh back in the 1700s um, one of the first, uh, the first botanical garden, uh, Bartram's Garden, uh, still exists to this day in West Philadelphia along the Schuylkill River. Um, and it's here where, where botany got its start, um, both through the importation of plants from abroad and the export of native plants from the U.S. Um, to England um, and other places um, in Europe that wanted to set up um, exotic plant gardens. Uh, but here we see a typical roadside Atlantis. Um, with its um, seed clusters. Um, you can kind of see why it was so favored. It had a tropical like foliage it has these beautiful colors. It's fast growing. Um, it's very um, adaptable to polluted environments. So it was introduced into Philadelphia in 1784, just north of Bartram's Gardens at a, a place called the Woodlands. Um, and I'm gonna show you a picture here. This is a picture I took back in uh, about 10 years ago, but this is, um, William Hamilton's estate, or former estate, which is now a cemetery um, called Woodland Cemetery. But here we see the Federalist style mansion that was built in the 1700s. And this is a really a, a gem for architecture uh, because it still stands to this day. This house was built, you know, in the 1780s, so that it still stands and it's, you know, um, a lot of the trees that made his historic um, estate what it is um, still stand as well. So we can see that in 1784, it really only existed in, in Pennsylvania, uh, in Philadelphia County. Um, and then in 1820, um, you could see that it, it moved a little bit. Um, I need to move this screen so I can see a little better. Okay. And, but then you can kind of start to see that it, it kind of shows up in various counties by 1855. Um, it's starting to show up in the western part of the state. Um, by 1925, it's, it's pretty widespread, except for you know, these colder areas in the Laurel Highlands and, and kind of the more rural parts of Pennsylvania where there aren't many people. Um, but by 2011, it's present in just about every county. Um, and, you know, this was part of this um, kind of an uh, investigatory work I did in, in trying to track Atlantis over time using um, uh, herbarium specimens and, and coring trees and, and, and looking at historic literature through Google Docs and things like that and Google Books, and we were able to kind of trace its, its spread forward. So again, you can go visit this um, historic estate. And, you know, if you've never heard of William Hamilton, um, <clears throat> certainly you've heard of ginkgo trees, certainly you've heard of Lombardi poplar, certainly you've heard of Persian silk tree. They were all introduced by this guy um, back in the 1700s um, because he was one of the few rich people that could import plants and afford to import ship fulls of seeds um, from abroad. And then he also had one of the first um, hothouses for plants um, 
like you see at some of these really um, fine botanical gardens now, uh, back in the 1700s, he had um, furnaces and he kept tropical plants under lock and key in these glass houses. The screen's not advancing. I'm not sure what's going on here. Hmm. Uh, just try clicking on it. Sometimes it just kind of goes to sleep on its own. Okay, that's. I think that's exactly what happened. So, um, you know, you think about Atlantis as this kind of spindly tree that occasionally gets big along the roadside, and maybe you find a big tree every once and again. Uh, but I can tell you that it lives pretty long, um, up to 150 years. And this is pretty long-lived for an invasive kind of pioneer species. Um, here are pictures of me, a little blurry. Um, these are around Philadelphia and Northern Virginia. Um, these are some of the larger Atlantis trees that we've cored and as part of that study that, that I published in 2013. Um, here we have uh, a tree, a kind of multi-stem from Doylestown, Pennsylvania. This is Lemon Hill Mansion in, in Fairmont Park in Philadelphia. This is the largest Atlantis tree, um, at least diameter-wise, in the United States. Um, this is in Montrose, Virginia, in the northern neck of Virginia. Um, this had a diameter of 80 inches. Um, and it was almost completely hollow. You can see how tapered it is and how the crown is very small, but you could fit several people inside this tree. Um, it's about 23 feet in circumference. Um, so really big, you can see two you know, adults standing next to it. This is a famous tree on the campus of Penn State. This is the oldest um, or the second oldest female Atlantis in the United States that, that's been cored and confirmed through tree rings. Um, another tree that we cored and, and perhaps the oldest living Atlantis that we know of and we, we've confirmed through tree rings is this about 130 year old um, tree that is in Chestnut Hill in, in Northern Philadelphia. Remember, it was first introduced in the Philadelphia region. So we thought, well, we'll go back to that area to core the biggest trees to see if they date back to the time of Hamilton in the 1700s. And as it turns out, um, you can't find trees that are that old because it just doesn't live that long. Um, and uh, here we can see that same tree in a historic photo from 1918 and uh, one I took in 2011. And that tree, again, is still there and you know still thriving in that kind of urban environment. Dr. Kasson, can I pipe in with our first question really yes. fast? Yes. Uh, someone would like to know if you have published these data on the historical spread of, the, um, of Atlantis. Yeah, in fact, this document down below, this is Kasson et al. Northeastern Naturalist Monographs. That's actually available not only through, uh, I sent um, Dr. Dar a copy. Um, uh, there, the Woodland Cemetery um, actually has a, a nonprofit organization. They maintain a PDF that's accessible on the internet. So if you just type in Kasson Northeastern Naturalist Monographs into Google, you should be able to find the PDF. And this is a 65 page monograph explaining this whole history of spread. I'm only giving kind of the highlights, but it's, um, you know, we basically dug through almost 230 years of literature, including many digitized Google books to find find the story and figure out how it spread. Great, thank so th you so much. Yeah, thank you for that question. So just to kind of show you um, where in Philadelphia, a lot of our um, large trees were centered on, um, you know, here's Philadelphia. This is where Bartram's Garden is in West Philly. This is the Woodland Cemetery was first introduced. Pratt's Garden, which is a, a famous historic mansion in, in Fairmont Park called Lemon Hill Mansion in Grumblethorpe and some other locations in and around the greater Philadelphia area. You can see where we cored a number of trees and the black circles denote that they were solid. We were able to core to the pith and get an accurate age estimate, whereas gray indicated that um, they were they were rotten. Oh, we were able to get a partial core out and, and you know, um, we were actually able to figure out the age of all these um, trees and I'll show you how we did that in a second here. Um, but those intact ones really um, set the stage for us determining the age of the partially intact ones. So, of course, when you go back to the literature, you can find tons of evidence of, of tree of heaven mentioned. Um, they called it Chinese sumac. Um, uh, they called it Atlantis. They called it Atlantis. Um, they called it, uh, you know, there was a number of um, Goddard bomb, a number of, of search terms that you had to use to dig these things out. <clears throat> but um, certainly there's pictures of 
historic trees um, in the literature and in um, different books. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this um, this figure in the lower uh, right hand corner. So what we did is we kind of mapped out the diameter. It turns out that a lot of times in the historic literature, people like to talk about the trees um, on the properties, especially in botanical gardens and, and er other areas of historical significance. And they would often report the circumference of the tree. Well, we can determine the diameter based on circumference. So we had a lot of instances where, you know, trees were reported from Bartram's Garden, for example, in the woodlands um, and all these other historic locations. But we know that it was introduced into the woodlands. What was really interesting is you never see big diameter trees at the woodlands until kind of contemporary times. In 2011, I was able to find some 70 year old trees there, but you never see um, instances where trees are getting bigger. Like you can see these gray boxes. That's a Bartram's garden. And we know from the historic literature, for example, that Bartram was gifted uh, uh, an Alanthus tree by Hamilton as a gift to his um, son who was uh, at his wedding. And he planted that in the garden and it grew and it grew and they documented it over time. Well, Hamilton was really stingy with his plants, um, even though he was the one who received the Lewis and Clark expedition plants and, and you know, people always turned to him for advice. He really coveted his plants. He kept them under lock and key and um, he didn't outplant these. So as much as Hamilton was responsible for importing a lot of these invasives, he actually would put them out each summer in these kind of artificial mounds um, to display them, uh, but then bring them in in the winter um, so no one could steal them. Um, so he never actually, um, he did, he's not responsible necessarily for the uh, invasion from these um, plantings because he never outplanted his plants. So that's really interesting. Um, what we were able to do with the, a lot of the coring that we did is we were able to kind of develop a linear regression to figure out the relationship between age of the tree and size of the tree diameter, as long as it was kind of an open grown tree, not one in a forest, but kind of on the landscape. And we showed that like diameter was a really strong predictor of, of age. Um, and, and that if you knew the diameter, you could basically figure out the age. And we did that for a lot of these historic trees to figure out, okay, how long was that, that tree that was documented here in 1850 in Bartram's garden, how, how old was it at this time? And we could subtract it and figure out when it first showed up there and if it kind of aligned with the historic literature. So this was a lot of like, you know, investigatory kind of work. It was a lot of fun um, just trying to figure out the, the history of Atlantis in this country. Now, many of you have seen Atlantis on the landscape in, in modern times, and you can't drive down a highway without seeing a lot of clusters of, of seed on, on female Atlantis trees. Um, and certainly, you know, that raises a question, you know, um, we, we know these trees can put out a ton of seed, but how much is a ton? And um, we kind of took on a, a this is some work that I did with my PhD student, Kristen. I started this at Penn State and, and was able to kind of finalize it with Kristen as a chapter of her dissertation. So we took seed from 50 trees in Pennsylvania. So while they were fully seeding, you know, mid season, we cut them down. We put all the seeds in bags. Uh, we we're able to count the seeds. Um, and then we determined that, that these trees could produce seeds from, you know, from four years old uh, to 104 years old. So the, the, the tree at um, Penn State, for example, which is the oldest seed bearing tree, um, still produces regularly about 900, 800, 900,000 seeds a year. Um, so we saw that seed production range from 40 seeds to, to almost a million seeds in a given year with a mean across all our sample trees of about 70,000 seeds per tree. And the germination was really variable. So some had 2% germination, some had 78%. But when you're cranking out this many seeds, you don't need to have a high germination rate to, to still have an impact on the landscape. Um, for example, uh, we also show that seven-year-old seed, that is seed we collected in, in a given year and then germinated seven years later, still had a viability of 36%. So that's really interesting. And I know Joanne Rebix on this call, and she's done some other um, complementary work on looking at kind of germination um, and viability of seeds in the seed bank. Um, and certainly she could add some perspective on that at, at a later time. Um, 
So we also did this kind of tetrazoleum um, chloride assay. Um, and this was kind of a, uh, to complement the germination assays we were doing to say, okay, well, how viable are these seeds? You know, germination um, could go wrong. And, you know, it's always nice to, to look at things from more than one angle and see if you could figure um, uh, out, out some things. And what we did is we basically stained these things to look for seed viability. And, um, you know, if they were complete staining, you can get sometimes complete staining um, showing that they were viable. Sometimes you just got the radical only. Um, and then if they were not viable, you would just end up with a seed like this. And basically the results of our tetrazoleum assay supported our germination rates. So um, that was pretty interesting. Is there a question? Um, Molly? Oh, no question, not yet. Okay, sorry, sorry. I, okay, sorry. great. Um, no problem. Um, so, so really the question, um, you know, there's a, we know that Alanthus is a prolific seeder. We know that it can um, live quite a long time. Um, but really, like, why is it only now becoming an issue? Is it because we only care about invasive species now? Well, I mean, certainly there's a lot more people paying attention to invasive species and their impact on, on native ecosystems and, and cultivated landscapes. Uh, but we also know that there's kind of a lag effect of how long it takes from the introduction of things um, to their kind of entrenchment in our in our native ecosystems. If we think back to that kind of uh, multi-panel Pennsylvania map I showed where, you know, it was in Philadelphia and then it took a while to establish. Um, you think about what was happening in the late 1700s, 1800s. I mean, we didn't have the Trans-Pennsylvania Railroad until 18 after 1850 with the completion of the Horseshoe Curve um, near Altoona. So um, we didn't even have uh, rail transport between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia until after that time. So C was kind of slow to move to new locations unless it was being moved deliberately through mailings or through people purchasing uh, things. And certainly we know the record shows that Alanthus became commercially available after 1820 um, and it was widely distributed in catalogs. Um, and it was it, it fetched a pretty hefty price and was comparable only to that of yellow flowered magnolia so it was it was a real treasure in a lot of gardens um so how do we end up with it being a problem in today's forest well we're paying more attention certainly uh, but really invasion into forests uh, on mass scale have only really occurred you know really in the 1970s 1980s and really after 1980 and the reason for that is kind of our change in land use management um, we know gypsy moth came through and devastated a lot of oak forests in the mid-Atlantic beginning around the 1980s. And there was a lot of mass wide-scale salvage cutting or clear cutting to salvage those timber. Um, and that led to a lot of openings. Now, Atlantis was already probably present in a lot of these locations, but just kind of lying in wait, um, you know, maybe a single female tree or just a few trees. Um, were there, but when this mass disturbance happened and kind of our, our cutting practices changed, that allowed for widespread invasion across these ridges where oak had once. And here's a picture of a scree slope in the Buchanan State Forest near Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. And this is all Atlanta stems. You know, one of the other things is, you know, widespread invasion, not only because they're fast growing, but I mean, what other trees can grow on a scree slope like that? I mean, these are big boulders. If this, uh, you know, this this tree species is thriving in this environment. And when we look at the max age, we cord a bunch of these trees and it kind of lines up with that hypothesis that, you know, widespread salvage cutting in the aftermath of gypsy moth mortality really um, uh, accelerated the um, establishment and, and spread of tree of heaven across the mid-Atlantic. Okay, so, yeah, I got another yeah. one for you. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. Please. Okay. Do you think the lack of a land in Maine is due to the lack of urban areas? Partially. Um, that that could be part of it. Um, certainly, when you think about Maine, um, the southern part of the state, Portland, um, and, and you think even you know up to Bangor and, and Waterville and some of these other areas, um, you know, they definitely have the railways and the urban, you know, urban kind of environment, but really cold hardiness has something to do with it too. We noticed that Atlantis, you know, we could find it close to doing well in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, 
and that's obviously a different hardiness zone than if you go into the uh, kind of um, Allegheny Plateau just to the east, um, uh, and and it doesn't do well there. And it's uh, you know we see that that fragmentation definitely plays a role in the spread of these things. One of the things I'm interested to know is how widespread road building um, during the Marcellus Shale boom, um, you know, starting in 2000, you know, eight 2007. And, and and going through you know modern modern day, how that might um, spread in invasives, including Atlantis, um, along those well pads and those roads, because a lot of there was a lot of movement of gravel and and other things. So um, certainly the fragmentation plays a role. So the more continuous um, landscapes you have, maybe the less invasion you'll get. Um, and and certainly cold hardiness plays some role there. Okay. I hope that answered the question. So oh, yeah, that was great. On the Tuscarora State Forest in South Central Pennsylvania, my PhD advisor, Don Davis, pictured here, and Steve Wacker, a forester um, with the PADCNR, um, got together to kind of look at some unprecedented wilted mortality of Atlantis um, that they were seeing. And of course, you know, these are areas that they were flying over during the gypsy moth outbreaks in the 1980s and, and, and through the 90s and where there had been a lot of control efforts um, to target gypsy moths. So these are areas that are routinely monitored and, and certainly they were seeing this widespread die off of this Atlantis that had come in following the invasion of these clear cuts in the aftermath of gypsy moth. Um, and certainly neither one of them were, were um, uh, feeling bad about this Atlantis dying off, uh, but they were wondering, okay, well, what's the cause here? So um, Don Davis and, and Mark Shaw, who was Don's first student on this project, began to look at kind of determine who the causal agent was. And basically they found two verticillium species, verticillium nanofalfae, which is the focus of this talk, and verticillium dahlia, which is a, a closely related um, native species as well, that was causing some disease in these stands. Um, but when we look at these figures here, we can see that the disease severity was much higher in the, and this back then the fungus was called Verticillium alboatrum. It's now called Verticillium non alfalfa but back when Mark Shaw was doing his PhD work. So these are directly out of his paper, so you'll excuse that the old name being used here. But it showed that it was disease was much higher compared to that of Dahlia or the water treated controls. Um, uh, and that was true for, for field. Uh, plants as well as um, seedlings in the greenhouse. Um, and basically that we're using a hypo hatchet. If you've ever used uh, herbicide injections in the trees, this is a really good delivery system for that. But we've co-opted that to use for fungal inoculum and basically make a spore suspension that we can inject directly into the trunk as if we were doing a um, hack and squirt um, herbicide injection. So, um, one of the first questions that, of course, Mark and, and Don Davis had was, you know, is this really sp specific to Atlantis? And they went ahead and they, they inoculated uh, a few um, co-occurring species that they would often find in these same stands and showed that striped maple was, in fact, susceptible um, when inoculated. So when you hypohatcheted uh, inoculum directly in the vascular system, you would get wilt and the trees would die. Now, from a forester standpoint, a lot of foresters don't like striped maple. It's not something we can manage for timber species, but it is a native plant. And it's something that, you know, we think about maintaining biodiversity. It's not necessarily something that you want to, to kill off because it is native. Um, but what Mark also showed is that, that although those plants that were directly inoculated died and would always die, the spread um, within a stand from inoculated Atlantis to striped maple was extremely low. We're talking less than maybe three to 5% of trees in and among dying Atlantis would become naturally infected and wilt and die. So it didn't appear that striped maple was a great risk of, of being wiped out by this because you know there were barriers to natural infections. Um, after this, uh, Joanne Rebick and Amy Snyder and you know some of the collaborators that we still work with today we're starting to report verticillium uh, wilt um, caused by verticillium non alfalfa um, in Virginia. This is work that Amy Snyder did and Joanne showed a Tar Hollow State Forest um, 
in, in southern Ohio. And I found a, another instance of this um, uh, in Burgettstown, um, kind of uh, west of Pittsburgh. Um, so definitely this was widespread. It wasn't just something we found in south central Pennsylvania and decided to, to spread around. It was it was popping up everywhere where we're finding large continuous stands of Atlantis. Now, one of the things I'll say as a plant pathologist is you often have to think about to get disease, you need the coincidental overlap of three things. You need a favorable environment, a susceptible host, and a virulent pathogen. Now, if this pathogen is native, it was probably present for a very long time. It's just that we didn't have a lot of host. And the changes in land use um, practices really allowed for continuous stands of Atlantis. We were able to finally see this disease emerging from the air and kind of clue into it for the first time. Because if this was happening in and around Philadelphia or on along the highways, it's not something we would pay attention to because trees are always dying along the highway because, you know, um, departments of transportation are spraying them or it's just a stressful environment. There's a lot of litter. We're not really paying attention. But in the forest setting, we pay attention. So I came on to look at efficacy and host range of this as it progresses across the landscape. Here we can see a shot of one of my sites at Buchanan State Forest. As we killed Atlantis, you can see the remaining crowns of non-Atlantis trees um, as, as the disease spreads throughout Atlantis. Here we can see the characteristic vascular discoloration that's associated with a vascular real pathogen, clogs up the, the water conductive tissues, um, the xylem of the plants, um, causing the staining, um, and then leads to the characteristic wilt that we know um, is associated with verticillium wilt. So uh, for my work, we inoculated 100 trees across 12 stands between 2006 and 2009. So 100 trees, um, and then we watched it spread. Uh, by 2011, um, we had over 40,000 additional trees that were infected um, and sprouts. And, um, you know, the fungus continues to spread. This I updated the slide, you know, saying that it will continue to spread in 16, but it's continuing to spread in 2020. Um, it's worked its way miles away and it's still, you know, working. And you can see kind of the different stands here. Um, we, we inoculated either 20 or 10 or five trees and it's um, in some places there's no more Atlantis. It's completely eradicated it from that location. Um, and as uh, new seedlings came up it wiped them out too. Um, it wasn't instantaneous always, but certainly we saw that, um, you know, um, there was native plants showing up uh, in those stands again and verticillium was wiping out um, the Atlantis. One of the questions we had early on was, OK, if this is an effective biocontrol, we have to make sure that there's not genotypes of Atlantis that are um, resistant um, or tolerant to uh, verticillium wilt. So I um, I went on an email spree uh, back in Penn State and I just cold called or emailed people I didn't know at, at state parks. I mean, I used the Internet to my advantage and I just sent hundreds and hundreds of emails. And most people would just get so sick of me. They're like, if I if I send the seed, will you just stop emailing me? Um, and, and, and turns out we got seed from 32 states and we're able to grow them up all together in the greenhouse. And um, what I found is that most seed batches you just saw similar mortality at the same amount of time. But in three locations, we saw delayed um, disease progression. Now we stopped it after 11 weeks. So ultimately these trees could have died, um, it, but there was delayed disease progression from these seed batches. So it could mean that there's a little bit of um, tolerance there. Um, certainly when we tried to isolate from these tissues, we found the fungus. So it wasn't that they were improperly inoculated. Um, we did um, have the fungus in there. It's just that they were able to um, not wilt in the presence of the, the fungus. So something was going on there. But we did see basically stunted growth in those instances where, you know, maybe there wasn't wilt, but the plant didn't look um, as as hardy as kind of a control plant. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, we expanded our host range test um, to many, 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 many other native plants um, in the um, you know mid-atlantic um, things that were really common you know tulip poplar and maples and things that were very uncommon um, black haw and and some of these others um, we wanted to see if the utility extended beyond 
um, just Tree of Heaven. So we tested a number of other invasive species, including things like Amur cork tree, um, autumn olive, um, you know, a number of things. Now, generally, the more host specific something is, the better off it is as a biocontrol because you don't have to worry about non-target effects. Um, we also tested things like Tree of Paradise and West Indian mahogany. You're thinking, <clears throat> I've never seen any West Indian mahogany in the Mid-Atlantic. And you're absolutely right. But the reason we tested these things is that they are really closely related genetically to Tree of Heaven. So we bought them from a nursery in Florida, had them trucked up, and then tested them in the greenhouse to say, Tree of Paradise, which is the closest relative to Tree of Heaven, is it susceptible? Well, as it turns out, a number of species did wilt following inoculation. And again, we were using kind of a hack and squirt method. In the field, we use a hypo hatchet. In the greenhouse, we would use a, a syringe. Uh, both instances, we would use a spore suspension and inject into the vascular um, system. And um, here's some vascular discoloration, and it varies depending on the host. You know, here's the yellow streaking we see on Atlantis. This is the chocolate brown streaking on striped maple, the kind of green color on Norway maple. Here we see sassafras with kind of a reddish brown flecking and red bud. And um, this is cucumber tree and uh, honey locust, American elm. Um, and a number of trees did wilt. But I think the big point here is that even though a number of trees did wilt, um, if we look at over time, you know, we see the trees, the disease or the mean crown, crown dieback goes way up. But over time, they return to kind of the same crown ratings as the controls, except for Alanthus. So Sassafras and Catalpa were two of those species that we injected them. They wilted really fast, but they were able to rebuild their crown. So it did cause a wilt, but it didn't cause mortality. So that's important to think about when you're trying to assess non-target impacts is it lethal to non-target hosts um with trees we can deal with some level of dieback if they're able to recover from that um, and that's exactly what we saw however we did see three species that did acquire infections through natural spread that is if in stands where we inoculated only Alanthus, uh, we saw spread to devil's walking stick which is aurelia spinosa we saw it to Roost Typhina or Staghorn Sumac, and we saw it to Stripe Maple. And the Stripe Maple confirmation is just kind of a, you know, it's a reconfirmation of Mark Shaw's earlier work. Um, but the thing I want to point out is, and we mentioned this in the paper, is that the incidence of natural spread is pretty low. Again, Stripe Maple, it's maybe 5%. Um, Staghorn Sumac, it might be a little um, more. Devil's Walking Stick, it was like, I think like 15 or 50, between 15 and 20 percent staghorn or um, devil's walking stick tends to occur in um, in kind of clonal bunches, kind of the way that pawpaw grows. So it's very likely that if one got it, it kind of spread through intra specific root grafts. Um, so you're basically infecting one parent root system, not necessarily a bunch of individuals. I mean, certainly there were individual stems, uh, but they all seem to be interconnected. Um, so that's that's something to think about as we kind of move forward here with uh, the utility and, and the efficacy of the host range of this biocontrol agent. Um, following my work, um, Amy Snyder, who, who did a lot of the work in Virginia, <clears throat> was looking at um, kind of some classical biocontrol. They were thinking about introducing a, um, a weevil from China, and I think that's still underway. Um, they're still assessing this in quarantine, uh, but this work, and you know, they've done many years of, of uh, evaluations on this weevil as a way to vector verticillium wilt. Um, of course, we have non-native ambrosia beetles, which were already established here on our native plants. Um, it turns out that these Eubulacea ambrosia beetles, um, these are fungus farming beetles that that basically form these kind of frass noodles um, or sawdust noodles because they're not eating wood, they're pushing out the wood to grow fungal gardens. And um, these beetles co-evolved, or they, they're from the same area of, of Asia that Tree of Heaven is from. So when they found, you know, we talked about the in, in invasional meltdown hypothesis where, where plant invasive plants might serve as beacons on the landscape for invasive pests. Well, um, this is Eulacea validus, and um, it's certainly found a home 
in in a friend that is the tree of heaven that it co-evolved with in asia so we're looking at uh basically the efficiency of of vectoring of the fungus um it does not farm the verticillium fungus but it can carry it on its exoskeleton um as it kind of goes into a, a verticillium wilt kill tree um it could pick up those spores and then move them um some work that was done after i left was by um eric o'neill who was one of my field assistants um during my time there <clears throat> and he was really trying to understand how it spread so fast um and it, it basically showed the role that root grafts play in transmission of verticillium wilts now we know vascular wilts often spread through through root grafts um, many of you may know the story and the, the demise of american elms from our from our landscapes certainly many of you might have an elm street in your hometown or know of a town that has an elm street with no elms on it and elms suffered a similar fate where um, dutch elm disease came in and spread from tree to tree through root grafts well root grafts seem to play a huge role um, in verticillium wilt spread in tree of heaven stands and and although this picture is a little um saturated or, or a little hard to see what um what was done is that eric cut down um a healthy ailanthus and basically poured a bunch of inoculum into a reservoir that he created atop it and um he put a dye in it a purple dye so he was able to see which trees were connected to that stump via intraspecific root grafts so in this way he was able to show that up to 20 trees around a single ailanthus are connected to you know one infected could could infect 20 more so we could see how this could spread so rapidly especially in a continuous stand where every stem practically in that stand is a tree of heaven um some of the more recent work is work that i was able to to mentor um my student kristen on and rachel brooks and and um at virginia tech i was on her committee so rachel and kristen <laughs> excuse me they combined to do some some interesting work. Um, certainly, we learned a lot from from my PhD work and Mark um, Shaw's work and and Amy Snyder's work, as well as uh, ongoing work by Joanne Rebick um, with the Forest Service. But there were still some unanswered questions. One of the things that we would come across occasionally would be the presence of verticillium dahlia in the stands, and there was a real question of whether or not dahlia um, would lessen the efficacy um, of verticillium non-alfalfi in those stands where they were co-occurring. So if a tree had a dolly infection, or if it um, would it would it keep out, competitively exclude verticillium non-alfalfi, um, would it lessen the ability of verticillium non-alfalfi to cause disease? One of the other things we were trying to figure out is that, you know, I mentioned earlier that verticillium not alfalfa used to be called verticillium alboatrum and alboatrum has a very wide host range <clears throat> and the question is like are the isolates from Atlantis actually specific to Atlantis um, or adapted to Atlantis or do we have to worry about them in infecting um, you know potato and other solanaceous crops and hops and you know some of these other things that are known to get verticillium wilt excuse me one of the other questions that that we sought to answer was, you know, questions about possible resistance or tolerance um, to uh, Atlantis. Um, I showed you a map where we we tested 32 seed sources from across the U.S. and we saw some delayed disease progression. Does that mean in those areas that verticillium has selected for a more tolerant Atlantis genotype? And that's something we have to worry that by using this biocontrol, we're actually creating a super Atlantis um, that can't be killed. You know, these are questions that we often ask as researchers uh, because we don't want to do more harm than good. Um, and, and also, the fact that I've been working on this 13 years and we're still working on it shows you that a lot of time, money, and effort goes into vetting these biocontrol agents to, to see if they really can be used in a way that helps users, helps foresters, helps farmers, things like that. So we wanted to explore some of these questions. Um, Cast, I just wanted yeah. to pop on and let you know we are at the 45 minute mark, but um, I'm just going to save the rest of these questions. There's about three or four more till the end. And 
typically folks, I don't want to speak for you, but um, I think this is an excellent presentation. So, and usually folks can stick around for more than an hour. So I just say, just keep going as you're going. And thank you. Okay, great, great. Um, so in my work originally in, in 2014, we published, uh, you know, this, this is what we call a phylogenetic tree. I want you to think about it as a family tree. Uh, because we try to understand the relationships of closely related strains of verticillium that are taken from different hosts. For example, I have a couple strains here from striped maple, and uh, and I have a uh, a couple of uh, you know a, a lot of strains from tree of heaven. And I have stuff from Aurelia and stuff from deerbrush, hops, uh, multiflora rose, a lot of solanaceous plants, including eggplant, tomato, potato. And the list goes on, and then there's another group. And what this basically shows is that the fact that there's a straight line mean that based on, on our genetic analysis, there was no difference between these strains from these different hosts. It was all basically showing up as the exact same. That's why it's a straight line. There's no differences. The only thing that was different were these verticillium strains from kiwi fruit in Chile and South America. Um, so they were they were obviously different, but all these other ones were not. Um, so we wanted to, to, you know, and that was based on a couple of genes. We use DNA sequencing and we sequence a couple of genes. We wanted to kind of use genomics to better understand these differences in some other modern techniques like mass spectrometry to, to really get at, like, are these things different? Um, one of the other things that we wanted to do is just kind of do some more comparative pathogenicity tests. What we mean by this is we want to take isolates from potato and put them in lanthus. We want to take isolates from lanthus and put them in potato. And we just want to do that and see what happens. Well, <clears throat> we put all these strains in Alanthus, and what this shows, I'm sorry it keeps uh, advancing on me. What this shows is that only two strains cause significant disease on Alanthus, and it was the two strains from Alanthus. All the other strains, although they caused some symptoms, maybe like chlorosis, there wasn't any wilt or mortality. Um, and here we can see a nice juxtaposition of, of what the Alanthus strains did on Alanthus versus maybe this is one from spinach. And this is really uh, Kristen Wickard's PhD work, um, and uh, we're, we're continuing to follow up on this. We haven't published this, but it is in her dissertation, uh, which is, uh, I think, publicly available. Um, so the, basically, the seed um, seedlings inoculated with verticillium not, not alfalfa from Atlantis um, uh, wilted, whereas the other ones did not. We also sequenced the genome of these things. Um, now, we don't have to spend too much time talking about genomics or why we sequence these things, but like really it comes down to liability. If we're going to commercialize something, we need to know that we can identify our strain. Like, for example, what if we put this out there commercially and someone says, hey, I just found a verticillium non alfalfa killing my you know, potato fields. Um, I'm suing you um, or because you basically released the strain. If we have the genome, we could say whether or not it's our strain or not. Um, because it's possible that there's other things out there that have yet to emerge. Um, but it's just also like trying to get as much data as possible. It's not just about fear of being sued um, and liability issues like that. It's more as a scientist, you want as much information as possible so that you can look at this thing from every angle and say, we assessed every everything about this and we feel comfortable. Um, and if you miss something, maybe you'll feel guilty that you didn't look from that angle. We also use this kind of um, modern mass spectrometry um, to assess these different strains. And this was really interesting. This is kind of what we're following up on. You don't have to spend too much time looking at this, but what I want to point out is our strains from Atlantis, which are indicated um, here in red, and some of the other woody hosts like striped maple um, kind of group here, whereas all the strains from hops and solanaceous crops group here. So it's telling us based on these protein profiles um, that these strains from, from solanaceous crops and hops are totally different from our strains from Atlantis. So that makes a better case that like, you know, the, the cross pathogenicity tests support that, but that our strains are unique and they're different from those strains that infect hops um, and other um, solanaceous and, and solanaceous crops. So that's that's really important. Um, but right now we're sequencing the genomes from all these different strains to do more exhaustive work um, and continuing to kind of assess these things. This is ongoing, so I don't have too much more to say about it, uh, but it is important to look at these things genetically. Um, 
some some of the work that Kristen and, and Rachel did in combination is they wanted to look at the biocontrol potential of verticillium non-alfalfa across the mid-Atlantic. I had done a lot of my work in South Central Pennsylvania. So um, Kristen and Rachel set up these great um, sets of plots across a kind of a um, hardiness zone gradient um, with Kristen's being kind of a, um, a, a more cold a hardiness zone and, and um, Rachel's being more in, in Southern Virginia being uh, the warmer hardiness zone. Um, and basically we wanted to not only look at across the hardiness zone, but like look at the impact of what if we inoculated, <coughs> excuse me, verticillium non alfalfa by itself, verticillium dahlia by itself, verticillium non alfalfa plus verticillium dahlia in a single mixed inoculum, and then a control. So if we go from left to right, this is non alfalfa, this is both, this is dahlia, and this is control. So what this is showing in both our cases, and we didn't have a dahlia only, um, that we whether they're mixed or by themselves, non alfalfa by itself, there's no difference. So basically, non alfalfa outcompetes dahlia and um, just becomes a dominant pathogen in that pathosystem. Um, whereas dahlia causes less severe disease, which is something we knew, and controls injected with water don't get disease, which is also something we knew. So this was done for three years. Um, and we just published this in Biological Control. This is Rachel Brooks uh, took the lead on this, uh, but it's a it's a great um, summary of kind of our our modern efforts to understand the efficacy of this fungus across different forest types and in different hardiness zones and whatnot. Um, so one of the things we were worried about is resistance or tolerance to non-alfalfa. We went back to some of the stands that were inoculated in 2006, and we found trees that were still alive. Um, and it turns out there was something called an escape. Um, an escape is basically a susceptible plant that, for some reason, hasn't been been infected yet. And this could happen because it's isolated. Think about that chestnut tree that doesn't have chestnut blight that you found in a forest. And, you know, um, it's a sole chestnut in the forest. Um, well, it doesn't have chestnut trees around it to spread, you know, for the fungus to spread from those to that one. So it's escape infection. But when we artificially inoculate it, it will quickly succumb to the disease. So the sad part is if we find what we think is an escape, we'll just inoculate it. And, and if it if it doesn't get diseased, then that's great because we have maybe some resistance. Um, uh, but if it uh, if it dies, well, it dies. Now, from an invasive standpoint, we don't want tolerance. We don't want resistance, but we still want to look for it because, again, we don't know if we're selecting for super Atlantis. Um, and I showed you kind of some delayed disease progression in some of our greenhouse studies, looking at seed across 32 states. Well, jo this is where really the work with Joanne Rebic comes in. Um, Joanne had been working in Ohio for, for a long time on verticillium wilt, and um, she was tasked with inoculating some, some Atlantis trees um, at this safari park and conservation center in Ohio. This was, um, and basically she had inoculated <clears throat> these Atlantis in the same way that we've always done. And, you know, Joanne's been working on this, you know, as long as I have and, and really like has refined and mastered the system. And she observed that after inoculating a number of trees, she wasn't getting verticillium wilt, even though she directly inoculated them with verticillium non alfalfa. So what was going on? They were still alive three years after treatment, some of which received retreatment. So um, what was going on there? So uh, Kristen re-inoculated these trees um, with the help of, of Joanne and, and some of the staff there at the wilds um, and some of the support staff of Joanne. And um, basically, again, some of the trees did die, but there were a large percentage of trees that didn't succumb to verticillium wilt, even though we typically can kill a tree in anywhere between four weeks and, and three months, you know, in a single growing season for sure. If it's a large diameter tree, it hold off and put out some sprouts the next year. But generally, within a year's time, they're gone, even with a single inoculation. So what was going on here? Well, let me give you a little backstory and a strange discovery that kind of came out of this. And this is yet to be published, but we're still following up on some of the work. This park was made on a reclaimed land um, dug by this dragline, Big Muskie, which was like a, um, owned by the Ohio Central Ohio Coal Company. Um, this land was mined for coal, and then it was reclaimed and then given to this um, nonprofit um, organization in 1984. Well, as the land became reclaimed, um, things naturally seeded in, um, including Tree of Heaven, 
And um, as we cored a number of these trees, and Joanne took us to the stands where she had inoculated them, we noticed some really significant radial growth suppression in a number of these trees. Now, typically with Atlantis, we see spacing like this. You can see a ring here, a ring here, a ring here. I've seen trees put on an inch a year, uh, more. It's crazy how fast they can grow, even as stands um, coming up as a single cohort. But what we were seeing was, in some instances, we were seeing kind of evidence of, of vascular streaking, but then like severe radial growth suppression. Now, when you see that on a tree, you often think, oh, it's stressed or it's, you know, water limited or, you know, maybe it's getting old and, you know, um, rings obviously get smaller as the tree puts on more circumference, but they don't get that much smaller. They don't get that, that suppressed. Well, we started thinking about the site and with some, some help of, of some people here, we started thinking about mine reclamation and there's a number of people here that work on that. Um, and it turns out that a lot of these sites are contaminated with metal, but there's kind of like it's been top filled, right? Um, and what's really interesting, if you think about how as trees grow, um, their root systems get bigger. And a lot of these former mines have a cap over them. Um, that is like clean soil that's been put over the a layer over the top. Well, as a tree grows, it's going to continue to grow and it may hit that cap and, uh, and that next layer and stop, or maybe it'll go into that next layer um, where there's more heavy metals. Um, and we know that like some tolerant, um, hardy invasive species can withstand toxic bioaccumulation. So we used a Bruker Tracer uh, XRF um, fluorometer to basically look at these wood cross sections. And what we showed was really fascinating. We showed that the trees that didn't have uh, wilt associated with them that were still persisting had much higher levels of iron in the tree rings. So basically these trees were taking up iron because they had penetrated that cap. And that's why they were growing normally. And then all of a sudden growth was suppressed. They were growing in the top fill and then they reached the contaminated soil. Growth was affected, not enough to kill the tree, but affect radial growth response. And in doing so, um, that hyperaccumulation of iron wasn't phytotoxic. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't toxic to the plant, but it was toxic to the fungus. Um, uh, so we basically confirmed uh, an effect on fungal growth using um, chelated iron in an auger. So we grew the fungus in the presence of iron and saw, saw decreased sporulation. And you can kind of see that here. But I think, you know, more important than that, I mean, you know, showing fungi growing on auger doesn't mean much. What you can see here is that the, the plants treated with a high load of iron, you can see the red here, um, are, are, are disease free, even though they've been inoculated with verticillium wilts or verticillium non alfalfa, whereas those with no um, iron um, are wilting and starting to die. So clearly these trees can tolerate a high amounts of iron, uh, but in doing so it safeguards them against the vascular wilt pathogen. So that's a really fascinating story, um, but it does have implications for where Atlantis might be able to persist in the landscape, even with the use of this biocontrol agent. So in summary, um, just kind of overview of this biocontrol effort um, over the last 13 years, um, natural infections of non alfalfa are widespread. Um, it's highly effective. You know, we killed as many um, in just a few years, we went from 100 inoculated trees to 40,000. So it rapidly spreads um, through functional root grafts. Um, Co-infections of verticillium dahlia do not increase, uh, decrease the efficacy of non-alfalfa. Um, and it appears that Atlantis isolates are host adapted. They're not host specific in that they can still cause problems in striped maple, but the incidence of natural infections is low enough where we're not all that concerned because there's a lot of striped maple in the understory and to, to take out 5% or less is to not take out a significant amount that might have ecological implications that we could predictor or foresee. Um, so Atlantis might remain an issue on reclaimed mine lands where heavy metal accumulation is an issue. Um, so follow-up work on iron hyperaccumulation is needed. Um, I need to touch base with Joanne again, so this is a good time to think about that. Um, comparative genomics are currently underway. Um, there's commercial production efforts underway um, through a company that's looking to kind of evaluate this and get EPA and um, USDA certification. Um, and, you know, the fact is that 
Um, spotted lanternfly and the brown marmorated stink bug like Elanthus. So it's really important that we kind of try to remove it or minimize it because it's going to serve as a beacon on the landscape and a bridge across the landscape to move these things from areas where in urban environments where, yeah, maybe they don't matter, but like to grape growing regions in the Finger Lakes and, you know, agricultural areas um, uh, where these secondary pests um, can build up populations on this invasive plant. So we're still looking for new outbreaks. We have obviously outbreaks in uh, Maryland and, or sorry, in Ohio and Virginia and Pennsylvania. And we've since found Dahlia in West Virginia and Maryland, but we're still looking. So here's some symptoms. Here's my contact information. And I'm happy to entertain any questions uh, with the time we have left. Thank you. That was fantastic, Dr. Kasson. Thank you so much. Um, we're getting tons of positive. I know I, I can just feel it that everyone's giving you a standing ovation right now. They're definitely pouring in the comments section. Um, that was fascinating. Uh, thank you. Um, should I stop sharing or, or should I leave this up, Molly? Um, either way is good for you. Uh, I think it's good if you leave it up so people can mark down your um, contact information. That, that works. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so we've got... For those of you who are able to stick around, um, I've got uh, about five or six questions here um, that Dr. Kasson's going to answer. Um, and thank you for staying those extra seven minutes. Um, I think it was well worth it. Um, all right. So first question is, uh, does your history of spread um, that we talked about early in the presentation, does it include the spread to the West, uh, specifically in the Pacific Northwest? So one thing I didn't have time to mention is that Elanthus, although it was introduced in 1784, it was also introduced in the West Coast um, at a separate time during the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, a lot of um, uh, Chinese laborers were used um, to build the Transcontinental Railroad um, from, you know, uh, Utah to um, to California um, and, and in those areas, a lot of, um, of Chinese laborers brought with them, Atlantis seed um, for its medicinal value and its, um, you know, cultural value and things like that. So there were separate introductions oh. due to that. Um, so they might explain the spread in the Western United States. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, uh, folks, a couple of folks wondered: um, Is there any evidence of um, this pathogen affecting Atlantis in Canada? You know. I don't know. Let me think about this. I feel like I got Alanthus seeds from Ontario at one point, but it, it's it's a little hazy. Um, I really don't know. And, you know, this is the problem with having these tools that like only are country specific, even though we're a continent that's very interconnected. It's unclear about the distribution of, of Alanthus in Canada for me. Um, if someone could point me to that, I would love to know. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised because verticillium non alfalfa is more cold tolerant. Um, we don't often find it, it doing well in, in really hot conditions, but I think it could persist um, in cooler conditions. So certainly I'm willing to to talk to someone and work with people if they're interested in looking for it up there and, you know, kind of um, understanding its, its possible distribution. I guess I need to know the host distribution up there. So yeah, I, I can't speak to them too much. Yeah, but that is that is a really good point and something we run into all the time, um, especially in biological control, because these things can be so widespread. So if mm -hmm. collaboration can come from it, yeah, definitely let um, get in touch, folks. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to one that I just that just came in because it sort of speaks to exactly what you were just talking about. Um, and it, the heat tolerance may be in effect, but uh, someone asked any word on whether or not uh, verticillium non alfalfa can be used in California. Wherever we have a lanthus and a fire event, the fire doesn't kill the tree, but it does cause them to sprout up everywhere and they become a dominant tree um, in, in these areas where there are fire outbreaks. Yeah, so we have an isolate of non alfalfa from California, not from a lanthus, from a, a plant called deer brush, which I believe is closely related to buckthorn, uh, but it's a native. Um, and I, I'm trying to remember what the result was. I think it was non-pathogenic on Elanthus when we put it in. And when we were doing comparative pathogenicity assays, we put all our different strains from different hosts in Elanthus. 
and I don't think that works. So we thought, like, if you can find an alfalfa from a different host, you could test it. But that's a good thing that something from a different host ends up being non-pathogenic. It just it further confirms that we we seem to have a um, specific um, uh, a, a lanthus specific, or, or at least a, 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 lant, a verticillium that doesn't impact native species. Um, and you know, remember, we're, we're positing this is a naturally occurring native pathogen because it's of its limited impact on native species, uh, but it's uh, obviously adverse impact on, an, on non-native species. Hmm. Okay. Um, is this a uh, form of biocontrol, is it available for public use yet? Yeah, that's a question we get all the time. Um, there are plenty of, of, of state departments of natural resources that are moving it around um, from sites where we had established it, in Pennsylvania and things like that. And <clears throat> it's not available commercially yet. It's not something you could buy at Lowe's or Home Depot. But it's possible we may get to that point. Um, we never did any kind of um, patented on, on it because, you know, after all, I was more interested in the science. Um, this was a forest pathology issue that became a, a, a really good biocontrol candidate. Uh, but we didn't go forward with, uh, there's a company that's pursuing that. Um, and we're involved a little bit in the science of it. But, you know, this is never about making money for me, but I can see its utility for the average land you, land owner. And um, this is similar. We found a biocontrol fungus for poison ivy. And, um, of course, there's a lot of interest to control that noxious weed. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, these are things that, like, take a long time to vet and make sure that, like, you know, you can't call these things back. Once they're released on the landscape, luckily for us, we're working with native or naturally occurring things. So they were found naturally occurring, whether or not they're native or they were introduced, you know, 200 years ago or 100 years ago. You know, there's a lot of work that goes into figuring those things out. But it's acting as if it's a native pathogen because of its limited impact on native plant species. Mm. OK, very good. Um, where did the seedlings that were somewhat resistant come from? Um, there were a couple locations. One was actually, interestingly enough, from uh, western Pennsylvania in the area where Berticillium wilt of Alanthus was first documented in 1915. So that what, that's what made me think that it was basically selecting for more tolerant individuals. And, you know, I don't have anything because we didn't follow it through beyond 11 weeks. We culled the experiment to try to isolate from the plants. Um, more data is needed before I can make any strong conclusions, uh, but certainly I want to look for the persistence of, of, of Atlantis in those areas and continue to go back to areas where we uh, artificially inoculated and it's now spreading to just look for survivors and see if they're not tolerant of infection. So um, the other places were Illinois and I, Massachusetts. It's, it's been a while since I've looked at the map, um, besides quickly going over it today. So um, that's in the plant disease publication. I gave you a PDF, so you can provide Perfect. a link. Yeah, guys, go ahead and go to that portal on forestrywebinars.net um, where you clicked to enter the webinar, and all of those PDFs are available for download right there. So I encourage you to follow up. Um, all right, I think this might be close to the last one. Um, with the increased stress of the pathogen, did you notice the uh, tree of heaven sprouting or root sprouts becoming um, more prevalent than normal? Um, or, yeah, I guess, or, or was, was it similar to the controls? No, definitely. Um, anytime you, um, you have a robust root system and you kill the above ground stem, it's going to respond by putting out new, new growth. So you get a lot of what's called epicormic sprouts, and this picture is perfect. Um, I'm strategically placed this because I predicted this question. No, I'm, it's just fortuitous. <laughs> so what happens is the stem dies and then it puts out a shoot because it's saying, look, I need to put out more foliage, you know, because I have this root system full of, of starch reserves, but I need, I have no above ground biomass to, you know, to convert the sun's energy into sugar. Um, so it puts out these sprouts, but these sprouts, you can see the sprout is now wilting, are um, uh, eventually are equally susceptible um, I don't know why that happened. Sorry about that. Um, they're equally susceptible and um, also wilt. So you'll get a lot of root suckers that, that also come up, but they are equally susceptible too, and they wilt. So it will kill the tree, 
the tree will respond by epicormic sprouts and and basil sprouts and root sprouts and those sprouts will become infected as well and die and it'll kill the root system okay okay um i know it, they they just keep coming in do, do you have a, another couple minutes dr Cassidy? yeah of course of course okay. all right thanks um are there any known associations between the non native oh okay so yeah i think some some folks signed in late so um this is just going to be a reiteration. Um, any known associations between the uh, invasive spotted lanternfly and oh, and verticillium non-alfalfa? Good question. Um, well, that was th there was definitely a question that we had, and I'm not um, working on this currently. Scott Salem at Virginia Tech may be working on this. Um, I'd have to catch up with him on this, but um, we were wondering if trees had verticillium wilt, if they would be less attractive to the spotted lanternfly. But, um, you know, it's really hard to go into an area and um, certainly in our areas where we inoculated years ago, all the, the trees are dead or dying. But, you know, uh, the spotted lanternfly can move around and they'll just probably find a healthy tree just down the street, you know. So even if even if it was less attractive, like if they had a choice assay and they said, I'd rather pick a tree that didn't have verticillium wilt, you know. There's always uh, tree of heaven is not the only host for spotted lanternfly. It just so happens that it's one of the most abundant, uh, perf maybe preferred hosts of the spotted lanternfly. Right, right. Um, if the biocontrol kills most of the Alanthus, um, can we follow up with herbicide um, on, on the few survivors uh, to prevent the development of genetic resistance? Certainly, I think that's a really good strategy. And in fact, when we think about pest management, we often think about integrated pest management. You know, biocontrol is um, just one tool in a toolbox. Um, and certainly these things coupled in, in the right way and, and kind of the timing and all that really leads to better management strategies. And, and, and certainly mechanical removal and, and you know, um, the one thing I'll say is it's frustrating is, you know, this idea that we killed a bunch of Atlantis and a lot of forests and that's exciting. But there were 20 other invasive plants in those same forests and stands that just took advantage. You know, um, mile a minute weed, for example, was in the understory. Guess what it did when there was a bunch of 60 foot dead Atlantis trees? It climbed them. Wow. So you basically had poles of mile a minute weed. Um, in, in those same stands, you had Japanese barberry and you had stilt grass and, um, you know, um, multiflora rose, polonia um, tree and um, Persian silk tree and all these other all these other plants. So, I mean, this is just one strategy for one plant and an important one, uh, one that's been entrenched in our forests and been here a long time. You got to remember, like, this is a plant that was one of the first invasive. Norway maple was introduced in 1756 by Bartram. So this is probably the second oldest invasive um, tree species. Um, there's a lot, you know, and I know um, Dr. Dar, I know your um, Dave does a lot of work on um, the uh, uh, calorie pear or the Bradford pear. I mean, that's introduced more recently and it's causing similar problems already. So, I mean, there's a lot that are being introduced. You know, they were introduced 100 years later than Tree of Heaven that are just now starting to rear their ugly heads. And it's going to, you know, they're going to be the next big thing. So, I mean, we're, we're trying to come up with strategies, but this is a, in some ways, it's a little discouraging because there's a lot more invasives out there to control. But certainly the combination of biocontrol and, and uh, herbicides and, um, you know, forest management strategies um, are a, a good coupling of resources and tools to to make an impact on, on, on restoring native ecosystems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, just a few people weighing in. Um, someone said, as for the distribution in Canada, it has been recorded in Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia, for the person who asked. Um, someone else mentioned, my work in the Eastern Rivers and Mountains Inventory and Network found some wilting Atlantis in the New River Gorge area no, near Beaver, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, they had the collection tested and it resulted in verticillium dahlia. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, and I'm, aw I'm aware of that. And dahlia is much more abundant. And, and the way you can tell dahlia is that you'll see um, you'll see verticillium wilted trees, but you'll notice that they still have foliage two years later. Uh, unless, of course, it's um, the, the situation with Joanne Rebick on this reclaimed mine site where it definitely was not alfalfa, but 
iron hyperaccumulation in the plants is leading to um, a lack of disease progression. But in most instances, you're going to see basically where you have um, a patchy wilting and, and basically survivorship beyond a year or two. It's probably Dahlia having an impact, but not really leading to death of the trees. That was such an interesting, the, the iron uptake. I, I've never heard of anything like that. That was, that was such an interesting case study. Um, okay, I think we're going to close out with just one more. Oh, where did it go? Um, oh, yeah, okay. So you, I'm sure you've, you've, you, you've sort of answered this before, but are there any proven control methods for um, Alanthus that the average landowner can try implementing to control and prevent new growth, you know, until this biological control agent becomes more widespread? Hmm. You know, I'm not sure on that. Um... I mean, I've heard of people injecting trees with everything from from diesel fuel to vinegar to, you know, and I don't really know how effective these things are. Uh, certainly glyphosate, uh, you know, Roundup works really well, I think, on, on Tree of Heaven. But um, as far as organic or, you know, non-chemical controls, girdling followed by herbicide management of the understory um, or possibly even, you know, deer tend not to browse on on. Uh, root sprouts of Alanthus. I'm not sure if goats will, but maybe goats can manage it. Uh, but, you know, it's an all or nothing at all thing with goats. I mean, if you're putting goats in there, you're not growing anything. Um, so I, I don't know that I have a, a, a good answer for that, but I, it's, it's... Oh, that was a great answer. <laughs> it's certainly something that I think about is that, you know, I'm a researcher and I want to I want to come up with solutions for stakeholders and I, I really want to help the people of West Virginia and, and people of the mid Atlantic and um, a lot of these solutions are slow to come and, and I know that's frustrating as a landowner. Um, but know that like, you know, we're putting all this work for 13 years because I, I care about seeing it through and um, I just want to make sure that we're not wiping out some important native species or having some more harmful impact on native ecosystems. Um, than if we had not ever entered into the game. Right, right. Um, all right, folks, well, we're gonna go ahead and let Dr. Casson go. Um, thank you so much again, Matt. You have been so generous with your time. Um, mm -hmm. This one was incredible. I, I enjoyed it from start to finish. So um, thank you so much. Um, folks, his contact information is up on the screens and I'll share it again in the chat box. Um, if you wanna reach out, um, I'm, I'm sure, you know, Dr. Kasson mentioned that he's he's open to that, so so don't be afraid to. But in the meantime, check out his works um, that are published on our um, on our portal page. So and and one thing I will so one thing I'll just say before we go is that you know um, I'm interested to know if you have verticillium wilt, but it's really important to to respect the um, the kinds of chains of command of moving. You don't want to be moving things across state without permission. Um, but we have colleagues at the Forest Service and things like that that we can we can properly bring samples in without you know without breaking any rules. Um, we do have to adhere to rules um, mandated by state regulatory agencies and and federal government things. So we're happy to um, to help with the discovery of a, a wilted tree, uh, but know that we have to work through the proper chains to make sure that we're not you know we're not breaking rules just because we're excited about something. That's a really excellent point. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for pointing that out. Um, okay, well, I guess that's it. I'll, I'll be in touch, Matt, but thank you so much. It's always okay. so good to see you. All right, thanks. Thank you. We'll Bye. Talk soon. Take care. Bye. Okay. Um, everybody, if you are having any sort of uh, CEU questions or um, any sort of technological issues, I'm going to stick around here as usual for about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so hit me up in the chat box and I will be sharing all kinds of relevant information like the websites that will be helpful or um, contact information for myself and our IT team, um, also for Dr. Kasson. Um, I definitely feel really fortunate to have just watched that. That was incredible. Um, and thank you all for sticking around for nearly another half hour after it was supposed to end. So, you know, we love our audiences here. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn off my video because it is making me self-conscious, but that doesn't mean that I'm leaving. Okay. Yes, I'm I'm sorry for those of you that I didn't get to your questions. Um I know he had an, a hard out at uh what would it be 2:30. 
Um, so I did have to let them go, but I have them all recorded um, on a Word document. So I'm going to send those to him and I will also post those answers in the um, in the same area where I've put all of the other publications and links um, on our forestrywebinars.net portal. Uh, yes, you can get a copy. Well, more you can watch um, the recorded version, oh, which reminds me, I need to stop recording. <laughs>